Welcome to Breakaway, the minor hockey podcast brought to you by the Ontario Minor Hockey Association. I'm Aaron Wilbur, your host, founder of the Coaches Site. As always, I'm joined by Ian Taylor, Executive Director of the OMHA. And returning for his second stint on the podcast is Big Mike, Michael Dundas, the Manager of Hockey Development for the OMHA. Um, it was so good last time we had to do it again here. Mike, how you doing? Ian, good to good, see you. Thanks for having me back, Aaron, so quickly. Appreciate it. You got well, it's it. Well, good. It's, it's good. We're right into it, right? I mean, we're into hockey season. Um, so, I mean, I, I know we're all energized by that. We, we, we were, you know, but yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, we're jacked to be talking about uh, um, hockey starting up. Um, tryouts were just about through. Uh, tournaments will be starting up. We've got that later start um, and then regular season. I mean, so it's, it's all upon us. Timing is awesome. Well, you know what? I'll tell you what, from a, a good news standpoint, I think this is good news. Um, I had a few conversations in the in the last week with people involved with minor hockey. And, you know, sort of the, the feedback was, we're so into it now. It's almost like the pandemic never happened. Like, you almost have to remind yourself. It's like, oh, yeah, we didn't really play normally. We're just in the thick of it. So I, I, I'm going to call that a win. Um, I think that feels good. And... Uh, but today, fellas, I hope you got a, a cold glass of milk because we're gonna we're gonna take down a couple spicy meatballs. We're gonna talk about cross ice hockey, and um, I, I think from my perspective, this might be if we look back, I don't know, say the last ten years, like this might be the most polarizing topic in our game at the grassroots level. So just maybe Ian, just starting with you, what's your yeah? What's just your overall take of, of you know, from the time of, of when this was introduced to where we are today and just, you know, the, the various feedback that you would have received? You know, I, I think, you, you, you know, when we, when we first introduced, you know, this being part of the Hockey Canada player pathways and, and specifically U9 and below and, and modified ice, cross ice or half ice, um, and, and, and in one hand, um, uh, you know, that had been around for 20 years, right? Like it, it had been around as a, through the initiation program and, and the benefits of cross ice. And we had shared all of those. Um, and, and in a lot of recreational programs, you know, uh, I, it was the go-to, it was the way you played. Um, so, so it, so it existed, but it wasn't across the board. So, so that was the big jump, right, Aaron? Like when you're talking about, you know, Jumping the shark here. That was it. It was implementing it for everybody. So, so um, again, our our task there was to was to talk about why now, what the benefits are, um, um, you know, both both short term and long term, and and again, as part of our our pathways and creating a, a, a progression. And and really, at the end of the day, it's to give those players the right start in the sport, um, and more than anything allow them to have some degree of success and most importantly fun because those two things will determine if the player comes back. And, and that's probably, that's probably the, the newest conversation we're having. It's, it's really not about cross ice and benefits and um, um, station based practices and fundamental skills. I mean, we've been talking about that stuff forever. Impl we've implemented it here in a formal way, but, but really for the first time we're talking about what do we have to do to give kids a, a great start in the sport so they'll keep playing, right? Like yeah. that's the new combo. So, so that's where we're at. And I'll, I'll just before I, I, I there's a long winded answer to your question, but just before I move on, I know last week we talked or, or in our last episode, we talked to Mike about, and, and Mike and I coached together and, and from, from, uh, I'm going to say novice and up, we now call that U uh, nine and up. Right. Um, um, but, but Mike and myself and, and, a, and a guy we coach with, Dave Crozier, um, we, actually, we actually ran an initiation program for a year. And uh, so, so, you know, I give, I give Mike credit. He is, you know, he works in hockey, um, you know, with us at the LMHA. But Mike is the single best um, uh, minor hockey coach volunteer I've ever, I've ever come across because he's worked from IP to – uh, to midget house league, a double a triple a. So, 
So, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I, I wanted to mention that because it's not all theory. Like, like we, we got our nose dirty at some of these yeah. <laughs> age groups, you know what I mean? And, and I was, I, you know, I, I was involved largely as a parent was involved in, in this IP program as a, um, you know, we worked with our association and, and, and we put it together and we would put together a weekly plan for coaches and they would do, so they would do that for what, Mike, three weeks. And then the fourth week, Dave and Mike would go out and they would run a session or, or maybe I guess they started with a session and then the coaches ran for the next three weeks and then they came back out, ran a session and then the coaches ran the next three weeks. So it was important for us. We created, we provided the curriculum. But those guys would go out and run the session um, and kind of kind of the, the teaching concepts that we wanted to instill in that period of time. And then and then they would hand it off to the coaches. So we weren't taking yeah. coaching out of we were developing coaches and players, I guess, is the way to to, to best say it, Aaron. So anyway, I, I know I'm going kind of sideways here, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned that um, because because, again, I, I, I think I think, you know, it's you know, it's, it's great to have. Um, um, people in the programs um, developing curriculum and, and helping, especially at the younger age groups. But it's not just players we're trying to develop; it's coaches too. So I, I just didn't want to miss um, speaking to that. And I, I know it kind of sounds like I'm on a soapbox a little bit, but but I just wanted to I just wanted to share that. Oh man, Mike, I feel like I <laughs> no worry. That was I, I, I didn't even call that up. Violation. I'm almost in <laughs> tears. Like first five years. <laughs> I... <laughs> no, 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 no tears. That comes later. We'll, well, we'll yeah. work. <laughs> well, I, but I mean, on that note, Mike, yeah. like, I mean, the fact that, you know, again, I, I think what's kind of neat here is like, I think all of us uh, have kind of been in the trenches, so to speak. And, you know, so I mean, just from your observations, and I think it's interesting now, we're at a point now with, with cross ice hockey and, you know, Ian, you touch on the, uh, station-based practices as well, where mm -hmm. there's been enough of a runway where for a lot of people joining the game, like, you know, there, there wasn't a change. That's just all they knew. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I throw it to you, Michael, like just having seen a couple of age groups flow through this development process. I mean, where, where do you think, Red? Is it, are, are we seeing positive strides perhaps compared to where yeah, we were? Yeah, definitely. I would, I would even go back just to that one year, like from – our first kind of sessions in October to where we got to in February and March, the, from the player side, the coach side, the parent side, the expectations, what they knew they were getting into is, you know, it, it's caught on really quick from everyone. Like they, they see the benefits, they see the positive of the program, how it's set up. And I mean, it's not new anymore, especially when you go to the rink, you, like we go, you go to the rink early morning now, around here and you'll have coaches pulling boards out onto the ice to divide, you know, the ice up. It's, it's a, an efficient process. I know the first couple of years I helped some associations and, you know, it took a while. They were building gaps in between their ice times just because of putting those boards together. But now it's like, it's, it's real quick. It's real efficient. So I, I think it's caught on. I think you see the benefits. I think you see the benefits just like from even the, you know, increase in skill level, especially in like tight spaces and what younger athletes can do nowadays with, with a puck, without a puck, how they can, you know, work off one another. It, that all comes back to station based, smaller areas, tighter spaces, having those opportunities, everyone having those opportunities, you know, not one or two or three players excelling in those situations and having those opportunities all the time. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's good. And I think it's only going to help improve our game as uh, from today forward. You know, one thing that's interesting is, you know, um, Ian, you talked about like when this was introduced. So just in, in you know, doing some research and preparing for this conversation, you know, there's there's some great information out there that's online. But when I started referring back to it, because I know there's some great data and, and we'll touch on this in a second. But I looked at the of when the information came out and I'm like, oh, 2013, 2014. I think one thing that I've that I've taken away is that we probably need to do a better job just as a overall hockey administration of let's not assume that just because it's the way it is that we don't need to continue the education process and remind people of why we do this because i think a lot of that information is dated and if, you, if your kids just started playing hockey in the last three or four years it's maybe fair to say hey like how how come we don't play it on the big sheet like like 
the NHL players, the game that I see on TV. And we'd say, oh, well, here's, here's the rationale. And then the second point I'll add is that to me, this is less about cross ice hockey and it's more about finding alignment with all the adults in the room um, on what we believe leads to good development. You know, I, Hey, do we believe that more puck touches helps players get better? Yeah. Okay, great. Do we think that um, playing in smaller areas, you know, where there's a bit more traffic, do we think that that helps? Yeah. Okay, great. And it's like, okay, well, basically we all agree on that. Now, this is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, you know, and so maybe on that line, like Ian, what's some of the, the commentary that you see as, as maybe some of the um, reasons of, of, of why we should not be doing cross ice hockey? Sure. sure. I, you, know, you know what, Aaron, your, your, your initial statement is, you know, you might as well have been sitting in one of our, our staff or development meetings and, 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 and that was it. That was, you know, we did, you know, pr probably, probably one of our best um, launches of a new program with regards to um, U9 and below and specifically modified ice for, for games, cross ice, cross ice for eight and below and, and half ice. Um, no, how does it go, Mike? It goes, it goes cross ice for seven, seven and below seven, cross ice. Uh, half ice for you. Yeah, uh, U eight um, half ice, so 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 divided at center, and then and then U nine uh, again half ice, and then transition to full ice in January fifteenth. So there's a there's a clear cross half, and then half to full, right? So probably the best launch we we'd ever done in terms of providing information. The stuff you talked about, more tuck, more puck touches, more engagement more shots on goal, um, again, um, the, the, everyone involved, everyone having a chance to touch the puck where the, the better player just doesn't, you know, get outside and is able to go, right? Um, um, and then, and then uh, you know, the a whole group kind of chasing. So the, the whole concept of, of right-sizing the environment based on the age and size of the kids. So, so um, again, we reached out to, um, uh, well, we, we took into uh, what's what the kids experiences now what happens at school smaller desks smaller chairs makes sense hooks are lower okay good that's an easy one um, then you get into other sports soccer has done a phenomenal job of it from you know um, you know they, they have different sizes for you know uh, uh, like seven and below nine and below 11 and below you know like before they actually get to 11 v 11 right um, smaller, smaller base pass, or 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 um, um, even if you get into pitching in, in baseball, you know, shorter shorter distance to the plate. Basketball, lower hoops. Tennis, cross cross ice on tennis program, or cross ice cross court on tennis program. So so they're, like right sizing makes sense. And I think if you if you if you can said that to any parent or person, they'd go. Yeah, that makes sense. Smaller bikes. I mean, you can go on, right? Smaller bats, yeah. smaller sticks, you know, like this puck. Yeah. Yeah. We don't ask kids in grade one to do book reports on War and Peace. <laughs> there you, you know, go. We, we get them the ABC book or whatever. It, sure. It is. It, it's so logical. And it's, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about this. It's like, and I think this goes back to your comment about, you know, making sure the kids enjoy the game and they stick with it. Like, Hmm. Can you imagine if you're if you were learning tennis and you you know you get out there you're on the court you know you follow the ball and you never got to swing at the tennis ball through the entire match like what are the odds that you're going to continue playing sure. tennis or you went out and played a round of golf and you never you just walked the course but you actually never took a shot and I I think about this so my little guy is playing soccer and as you said like yeah. he's playing on the little uh, fields. He's never come home and said, I just played a mini soccer game. He comes home and says, I played a soccer game. And he's pumped. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but I, I look at it, but there's kids even in that small environment where they can go the whole game without touching the ball. And you can see, like, it, without sure. that, it's not, it's not fun. So I think, like, that is such a fundamental piece here is keeping kids in the action. So exactly. Um, so I think so, that's so Aaron, well so, Aaron, your second point is, you know, where are, where are we hearing the – the challenges are so. I mean, overall, the feedback has been really good. I, I would say overall, and we and we've heard those stories of, you know, 
my my son or daughter, you know, got to touch the puck and was, you know, more involved. And um, so so that's happened. But th- now the question th- then becomes, you know, are, how are we are we grouping players properly by skill level and, and whatnot, depending on how many players we have. But we'll, we'll put that one aside. Um, but but we we're, we're getting into, OK, well, what about, um, you know, the kids are bunching up. Um, so, so, so there's, you know, the, the play is just, is just a mob, you know, of, of around the, 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 you know, around the puck. We, you have, uh, questions about, um, uh, players not being able to get to top speed. Um, you get, you get questions about, this is, this is one that becomes, um, uh, you know, about not learning the rules, right? About they, they don't know what I, 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 icing and offside is. Well, you know, I, I, again, for all of these, you know, these, these are things that, that would be involved in that transition period at U9 to full ice. I mean, we, we can teach offside. I mean, we, we have games, and, I, and I'm sure when we, when we post this, um, you, know, m- you know, Mitchell can post a video that we have about teaching icing or teaching icing, teaching uh, offside using a cross ice game. Like, like we have, there's lots of creative ways that ultimately we can teach that. That's, that's not going to be a barrier to anybody. That's not going to be a, that's not going to be an ongoing challenge to, you know, to players. So I, I, I think there's ways we can address this stuff. Well, I, I would just like to point out that, like, when you watch the <laughs> NHL draft, they do the breakdown of kids. Like, Bob McKenzie or, you know, Elliot Friedman, who does the analysis, nobody said, oh, gosh, well, you know, this kid's got a really good grasp of offside. Like, that's why we're, they're picking him this high is because his, his, his acumen for offside is just on point. And, man, you should see this kid ice the puck. <laughs> I haven't heard that yet. So, no. apparently that can be figured out later on. So, um, I mean – yeah. So, I mean, you're on, I mean, you, you got it, you're right on it. So, I mean, but, but these are things I think, you know, so, so what we end up always talking about is, is the game, right? Well, well, you know, how can we, inf- how else can we influence? Well, we influence a practice, not in the game environment, the training environment. So you talked again, we talked about station based practices to teach skills, but, but practice is an opportunity. You can start introducing concepts, we can start introducing spacing on players, you know, and 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 uh, support and all these things. I mean, these are things we can teach, you know, in our drills and a practice. Yeah. So so then you can use them in the game, right? So it just becomes so game focused, Aaron. That's and, and we want it to look like the NHL, like that. I guess maybe that's the issue. It, yeah, and I, and Mike, well, we're gonna you. add it to you, but I, I just. On that point, so here, and I'd be curious to know if you guys have this situation. So here in Vancouver, there's a couple of associations that have access to mini rinks, right? Mm. So if you take the dimensions, it's the same as cross ice, but there's boards. So it looks like, and they have benches on the side, so it's it's a mini rink. And I've heard so many parents say, well, that association over there, those kids have an advantage because they don't play cross ice hockey. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They play on mini rinks. They're like, no, 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 no. They play like on hockey rinks. So it's the same. And I'm like, it's the same thing. And they're like, no, it's, it's, but it's a visual perception. And at the end yeah. of the day, I'm like, so what you're really saying is you just want your kid to look like they're playing in the game you see on TV. That's what a big part of this is. And I just think that's a really good point. Michael, when it comes to, you know, Ian talks about educating coaches. How do we educate coaches about, the benefits and, and maybe what are some of the, the things that you would point to, to get um, to ensure that they're, I guess, relaying the right information and, and understanding that, that this is, this is for the benefit. Yeah. There's, the I mean, the, the pathways alone, just those pathway documents, the, the player pathway documents have a ton of like background into why this is better for the younger player. It's about scaling the game. It's about focusing on, you know, the fundamental skills. Um, but there's, there's tons of resources on it and, and that can support coaches. Um, like from, from even just game rules and how to apply them at a modified ice programming. And Ian touched on a good point. It doesn't have to happen in game, in a game situation. It doesn't have, but it can happen in the practice environment, but, conversation we had actually last week was why does it happen have to happen on the ice i mean we have so many coaches that provide you know video sessions with their older groups it's trickling down to you know you see it at u11 u10 now that they're having video or pre-game video or 
feedback through video. Why can't coaches do an off ice session where they go out to the parking lot after a practice and they lay down a blue line, red line, blue line, and they can teach icing there. Or maybe it is a, a Zoom call or a video session in the dressing room where they can go through the game fundamentals and those rules. And, you know, kids are kids now are extremely visual learners, I find. I, I, there's no, like, there's no more, as not as many kids learn through audio as they do by feel, touch, and doing and, and seeing. So I think there's a great opportunity that you could take it out of the, the, the formal practice on ice environment or the game environment and teach it in a lower stress setting and you can move players around. So there's lots of opportunity there. Um, Hockey Canada network app is a great one for, for coaches to point to. They can break down by skill, by age, by level. So there's a lot of opportunity for coaches to get into those resources and, and help support them with their seasonal plan. The Coaches Site is a proud partner of the OMHA along with many of the top development organizations in the world. The Coaches Site was created to provide hockey's top coaches, leaders, and performance experts with the platform to share their experience and insights with amateur coaches and minor hockey organizations with the goal of enhancing the development opportunity for all players. A membership includes access to 500 hours of educational videos, a library of over 700 drills, articles breaking down the latest tactics and systems, and our newly released initiation skill series, which provides a video-based development curriculum for the first three years of a player's minor hockey career. Regardless of the level you coach, the Coaches Site is going to provide you the ultimate coaching toolkit. Listeners of the Breakaway Podcast can save 25% off an annual membership by using the code OMHA when they register. Again, use the code OMHA and get registered today. Yeah, so so for anybody watching, what I'm grabbing here, see, there's a guy I have on my shelf. That's uh, is that Stamkos? No, that's a that's Victor Hedman. Oh, okay. So anyway, so we got a mini mini Victor Hedman. Okay, we got a mini Victor Victor Hedman. So I can't wait to see I, where I, this goes. I I can tell you when I was coaching. No, it it was it was full ice. Um, it would have been you. Yeah, but it was a year before as well. I did it. So, so, and it was full ice, but, but the, the kids still, we had, we had gone from uh, half ice uh, or cross ice the year before and then full ice. So we took our coaching board, laid it, laid it flat uh, on a table and brought a bunch of these guys out. And that's how we taught offside. I just, and I, just as you, Mike said that, I, 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 that, that was a flashback. So we, we put all these guys on the, on the coaching board flat and said, spoke about, you know, the player perceiving the puck and all that. So, so like, there's, there's no short and, and kids, like you say, kids are visual, low tech versus Mike's talk and high tech. But uh, so, um, but there's, there's, there's no shortage of ways you can be creative and kids, you know, they like seeing the little hockey players and, and all that sort of stuff. Right. So like, like there's lots of ways to teach this. Um I just that that's that's where the creativity kind of kind of comes from, and it and it'll stick too. I promise you. Well, th- there's there's also, and I'm going to dive into some stats here, but there's also the analog way to teach that, Ian. So, um, um, back when I was involved as a hockey director, um, this was not my idea. This was adopted from you know yep. through the association over time, and they had an idea which I, I thought was really good. They said, okay, in the second half of the season, so after Christmas, U8 players every Saturday. Two teams were going to come together and they got a 45 minute session to play a scrimmage game on the big ice for the purpose of getting familiar with the line changes, getting familiar with the big sheet of ice, offsides, sure. et cetera. And the coaches would be out there running the show. So it makes a lot of sense. And it was, and I thought that that was a really good bridge. But what was interesting, and the parents are like, they're showing up like it's the goddamn Super Bowl, like they're, you know, they're making it, which is, which is awesome because the enthusiasm is great. Right. What was interesting is the kids in that 45 minute ice sun, their feedback. This is boring because we got to stop and explain the offsides. Well, the line changes, well, the line changes when eight year olds, they take forever. And the kids were like, we just want to go back to where we just play hockey and touch the puck and try and score goals. 
And it was and it was every ice time. And again, so I think there's a part of this. Let's listen to the kids. Um, Out of the mouth of babes, that, yes, for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and so I just want this is really interesting. And I don't know if you guys have seen this, but I remember when this came out, it was kind of cool. And I think it's worth sharing. So uh, back in 2017, USA Hockey yep. at Joe Louis Arena, which had, yeah, it was at the time the the home of the Detroit Red Wings. They took a group of um, U7 players and they had them play a game cross ice and a game on the full ice. And they literally brought in like the tracking systems, like the analytics they use in the NHL. And mm-hmm. they got some, some, some raw data. So here's what they found. Um, if, you, if you feel that touching the puck is important in a player's development, well, players in cross ice touch the puck twice as much. Um, they made two times as many pass attempts. This is interesting they had six times as many shot attempts. Um, They received five times as many passes. They were in twice as many puck battles. They changed direction twice as much. And man, oh man, to the comment about full speed, Ian, when you look at an NHL game, if you talk to any NHL skill development coach, any NHL head coach, I guarantee you they will talk to you that the change of direction is what separates players um, at that level um versus speed um and the goalies had four times as many shots per minutes and when you look at it like that it's like gosh like that all seems like really important stuff and and aaron if 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 i'm not mistaken i want to say for that study it was a i i want to say it was like a u9 little caesars team like it was a it was a good team Meaning a yeah you know, a, a double A or a triple A level team. It was it was sorry it was eight U and I'm looking here. Yeah, I'd have to confirm, but it was I believe like the kids definitely look like. I think um, it was you know yeah. and, and 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 so these were you know um, again for that age level kind of higher skilled players. Let's use that as a as a descriptor, and and so. Um, uh, you know, meaning they could execute these, you know, they could pass the puck. They could right, like, the, like they were doing those, they were playing hockey, you know? So I think that's important because I, I think it gives yeah. some, some context there. You know, the, the, I, I really like your point about, about the skating overall. And I mean, you know, again, Aaron, you, you, you have, you have more engagement with, with, you know, uh, professional NHL, you know, European coaches and than, than anybody. So, I mean, you know, the, the days of the, the, the 200, you know, you know, skate behind your, your own net and, and wheel the whole, you know, ice surface, they're, they're not happening too much. I mean, to me, it's coaches are everything about 10 foot races, right? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, quickness, g- gathering loose pucks. I mean, I mean, I, I can tell you the way, the way we've changed how we, um, what our focus is on skating when, when, when Mike and I, when, when we coach, um, um, when we teach skating, when, when we first started, we were doing a lot on striding, right. Yeah. Um, y- you know, like the perfect stride and we were all trying to, you know, um, you know, emulate this in all players. And, and, and when we found one, people just have different mechanics. They don't all move the same way. So our focus changed completely to, um, focus on edges. That's all we do now. Um, we, we, um, again, two foot, two foot, you know, inside and outside, then one foot and then transitioning on one foot, spending most of the the game on one foot is, is, you know, and, and so that's where we spend all of our time. All of our time in skating is edges, edge focus. Um, and, and then it, so then it becomes a, a skill focus as opposed to the, the feeling that we're just skating, you know, we're just, you know, um, you, you know, or, or condition skating. It was actually, it's, it's actually giving them a skill that that's, that's simple weight shift. Weight shift is my favorite skill in the world. And I tell everybody and they think I'm crazy, but it's, it's just, that's my simple, it's the simplest skill to work on. And it's, it's every player can, can implement that into their, in, into their game. So um, our whole focus of how we teach it has completely changed, completely changed. So, yeah. so why would that not, you know, um, again, uh, land, land where we're, we're, we're starting, you, you know, Aaron, we've talked to, to experts on shooting the puck, Tim Turk, people don't shoot the puck the same way anymore. Technology's different. The way you hold the stick in your hand, the way you flex it, right? Like, so skating's changed too, completely how we, 
how we teach it and and then and then how the game's played everything is so quick as you said tight turns evasiveness um um ability to change direction pivot all that right this like the the comment the comment I make to people is the moment when you do go to full ice at at U nine when we transition and forevermore the ice surface from that point on is getting smaller from that point on because players are getting bigger faster right so uh, yeah a hundred percent and listen it's funny like back to the commentary from NHL coaches and I think this is interesting and it speaks to the value of it is that. Hmm. So they play an 82 game schedule. There's very limited practice time. And of course there's yeah. players that in the NHL might make a living from, you know, they're kind of paid not to touch the puck a lot. It's like, Hey, you get it out of your zone or you get it over the line or, you know, you yeah. dump it behind the net and you bump into people, whatever. But what the coaches at that level with their limited practice time, they utilize not so much cross ice hockey, but they use small area games, but it's like, Hey, we need these players to touch the puck because even if they, we're asking them to touch it a limited amount of time. We need them to execute and we need their reps. And with a 45 minute practice, we might get two of those a week, depending on our schedule. We get so much more out of the small area games and just getting those players, their rep and handling pucks under mm-hmm. pressure. than we can replicate in drills or, you know, full ice scrimmage. And they said, otherwise these, these players like, I mean, take your, your fifth and sixth defenseman on an NHL team if, if they don't get those reps, then all of a sudden they barely touch the puck in a game because they're playing limited minutes and they, they just fall off. So it's just mm-hmm. interesting from that, you know, at that level that, you know, their frame of mind is they see the value in these small area games. But, you know, Michael, like from a, from a strategic standpoint, you know, what, what advice do um, you give coaches or would you advise to sort of, it, you know, try and enhance those skills that players are going to require, I think, to be successful in, in cross ice hockey. Yeah, it, like it goes back to fundamental skills. Obviously, like they're still so young; they they haven't perfected anything. They haven't had the ten thousand reps. Like they're still they have to work on everything. Skating is the key, I think, to it. There, like, there's got to be a lot of focus on skating. I think the other thing that gets missed in in, in changing cross like to modified ice cross ice half ice from full ice is kids at a younger age are having those moments of incidental contact so they're getting comfortable being pushed off balance yeah that's a good point bumping into one another when you play in a full ice game and you're chasing all the time it's almost like you're just doing like a power skating session on your own you're you're you're, you're still skating you're still maybe transitioning not as much but you don't have those instances where you're shoulder to shoulder with another player and you're off balance or you're learning how to protect the puck or you're you're taking you know some weight from another player and being able to stand on that one foot which we we teach and we teach in a skill setting but when it happens naturally is when you really got to put it into into action Uh, Ian and I were talking about just last week on you know how we learned you know balance and it was just running through the forest as kids and if you you go to hop the river like gotta land on the one stone and if you don't hold your foot and make that land and hold your balance to get over well you're wet (laughs) maybe that's how we should do tryouts (laughs) but there's all those little things that happen in those in those situations but like yeah like it it comes back to breaking it right down to those skills giving the kids the players the tools in their toolbox so that they can be successful once they're put into a game situation well, you know, I want to go back to, to Ian's point about how the game has evolved. So um, last week I had a conversation with the head of um, coach development for, for the Finnish Ice Hockey Association. And just to paint a picture of how the game is constantly evolving, I think it's really important that with all these changes in our game, and Ian and I have talked about this before, it's, it's not like somebody at Hockey Canada or USA Hockey or wherever like shows up to work one day and says, hey, you know what, we're just going to do a 180 here and change the complete way we do it. Like this is all research based. There's, 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 you know, sports scientists involved. Like these are decisions that are years in the making. But case in point, so in Finland, which I would argue might be the most progressive country when it comes to hockey development, you know, they, they had sort of spearheaded the whole, you know, cross ice hockey, uh, station based practices, etc. But they've made a change based on feedback and based on data. And they've said at the U7 level, they're actually trying to move away from the small, uh, the station-based practices. 
and they're moving more towards even more games. And the rationale is that when kids are learning to skate, they learn better when they're just in an environment in a pack and they can just sort of try and keep up with the the herd or the little swarm of bees that you see at the youth hockey level than they can from being instructed to go around pile. And so they're actually, but again, that was years of observations of collecting data. And they said, hey, so now we're actually at these levels. And then we steer them more into the, to the station-based games at the U8 level. And then obviously the transition to, um, you know, the big ice. And so I, I just found that that was really interesting where um, I think for everybody that's providing commentary, at, at some point, A, we have to be aligned on on what we believe uh, aids a player's development. So if that's, you know, reps, touches, et cetera, then okay, then let's, let's agree on that. And the second part is saying, okay, like, who are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to the people that spend um, all day consulting with, you know, experts that are analyzing data, or are we going to listen to, you know, the parent beside us on the glass that says, you know, this is BS. We should be playing full ice hockey and with no other substance other than that, it's just an observation that we should be playing full ice hockey. So that, that's my turn on the soapbox, Ian. Um, no, but you I, know but what? I, I, yeah. I, I, I love it. And I love, I love you, you, you know, the finish model. And I, I don't know if, you know, I mean, people are probably sick of us talking about Finland, quite honestly, but, but they just keep, they just keep, um, showing up or, or, or being relevant in our conversations. And, and when you say that, like, like I think of that and, and, you know, you've got me, you've got me spinning here. I'm, I'm thinking, okay, you know, like what boxes does that tick for those younger, those youngest players? Well, they're, they're engaged, they're, they're moving, they're, they're, um, they're using the skills without really even thinking about it. Right. And, 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 and I'll be honest, Aaron, like that's, that's one for me that, that was eye opening to me. That was a non hockey example. That was, that was, you know, my younger guy taking, um, um, you know, learn to skate program and, uh, um, lessons I learned from those instructors. Uh, first they'd have a bunch of stuff, right? They'd, they'd have bean bags, they'd have, um, yeah. baskets, they'd have balls. So, you know, kids were going and yet they had to grab a bean bag and put it in a basket 10 feet away. Well, they weren't thinking about skating. They were just doing the, Bingo. you know, the action, the activity, right? Um, um, big, big one that I still use today. Mike and I carry around those big, the 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 big wide sharpie markers um, to write on oh. the ice. We we write on the ice, ah, and, yeah. and and they used either those or or bingo dabbers. I think those were the two that people used, and they would write. You know, they would they would draw this pattern on the ice, and the kids had to follow it, right? And I'm like, like, that, so there's a coaching hack that I learned from skating, you know, God, I don't know how many years that, that is now, but from skating instructors that now we always have a marker in our hand, in our pocket to show, you know, patterns or whatever, but, or, and have stuff. That's the other thing I would say to coaches going to ice. Um, again, sticks, you know, cut off sticks, you can step over, um, you know, not just the traditional pylons and pucks, you know, uh, we, we used to take the little, you know, and I'm sure you have them at home, Aaron, uh, the little mini, mini hockey nets, you know, for basement hockey, knee hockey, whatever you call it's it. How I, it's how I started my day, Ian. It, so, so I would take those to practice and, and we would have, oh, so really? it would be, Oh yeah, yeah. So because there was only so many nets and we had four teams on the ice or whatever it was at that time. And again, in our station or three teams and, uh, we'd put them out there and it would just, you know, if you could do this and then shoot in the net and then pick up another puck, like it was just whatever. It was just, you know, I, I I've told you before, it's easier to run a, a, you know, a U15 practice than it is a U8 practice. Because if one goes south, you got to have another one ready to go almost, you know, immediately. And so, so th that's the other thing I would throw at is, 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 you know, again, create it, create an environment where there's challenges. And I think that's, you know, that was your point to start about having them kind of in kind of game-like situations, right? Play more. Um, but, but also, you know, again, introduce these things that they can maneuver around, think about, hop over, through, you know, it's, it's, it's the attention. You keep their attention, you keep their engagement, you know. Well, I, I love where this conversation has gone now, just about, um, I think, ideas and how we can just focus on development because that's yeah. I think what you know, really matters. And just maybe to add some ideas to the pot and it just, you know, let's just go 
for the sake of it, let's go back to Finland. Um, so mm. like we've done some work with Jokerit, which is a club there. And like one of their big ideas is they recognize the kids got really fascinated with that Red Bull crushed ice <laughs> or no, Red no, not crushed ice. Yeah, that's crashed ice. Crushed ice. Crushed ice. Yeah. yeah. Crushed ice is yeah. for another activity. That's yeah. later. Um, yeah. Um, but so they, they created that for the kids. They use like the little, um, the padding and they used the mini sticks where they got to step over and they just created, and they said like, eventually it just became a funding with the coaches to see who could come up with a, a date. And that's how they would start practices at the U8 level. And they're like, the kids love, like they loved it. And, right. and, and so they did that. And then, you know, to your idea about the AIDS, and I think this is so interesting. So my little guy is in, um, he's in learn to skate right now. Mm. So it's like, you know, the yep. community based program, it's I think yeah. everywhere in Canada. And, um, so he is in, so he's kind of gone from like, you know, starting out. So now he's kind of in the group that, uh, um, they're doing some diff more advanced stuff as, as advanced as you can be at, you know, three and four. But, um, so our neighbor, we have a family that moved beside us. They're from Australia. They've got a little boy, same age as mine. And they're, you know, of course we're comparing notes. So both our kids do gymnastics together and they're like, Mackie, their son, they're like, hey, we just, we signed Mackie up for the skating lessons. I'm like, great. Awesome. They're like, does he need skates for that? And I'm like, yep, <laughs> that's going to be a pre -run. He's gonna definitely going to need skates for that. So we get Mackie set up with his skates and he shows up. He's got his dinosaur gloves. Well, in his group, so they've got the five kids that are literally starting from scratch. The coach has a bubble maker, like or a bubble gun, I guess. Yeah. It and it's yeah. phrase bubble. So the kids got to go chase the bubbles. Sure. And um, so... But the problem with the bubble makers, all the other kids that have already graduated from that stage, they're like, I want to abandon what I'm doing and I just want to chase the bubbles. <laughs> and then you can see like my little guy's like, I want to go do what, what they're doing because that looks like way more fun. So I think that creativity and those ideas, I think it's so important that we share those ideas because you hit the nail on the head, man. Like at, at that age, it's, it's, it's challenging. Um, you know, you got to keep it creative and you got to create it fresh. And I, and again, I go back to the kids feedback. Like I have yet to hear a child complain about cross ice hockey. All I've heard is them just say, I played a hockey game today and I, it was it's fun. It. So, um, that's it. You know, Michael, any, any other like further comments again, just from, from being, I mean, you're having so many of these conversations with the people, you know, um, out there doing the work what what, what any other ideas on, on how we oh, can we have, enhance it or we have a guy we have um, a guy that works for, with our coaches program tim uh tim mccorder he's up in perry sound and he's he's like he at this age u9 and below kind of it, like the resources he has and the ideas he implements on the ice is like pretty impressive he always has a skipping rope, like a double Dutch skipping rope out on the ice. And that's like, and he just gets no kids skipping rope or jump, like playing helicopter and jumping over the rope, which is like balance and agility on that stuff. The other one I saw him use was bowling pins. So, you know, what a big, like, so come on, a big thing. What's the biggest thing that people have when they're learning to skate falling down? So now you're putting a kid in a yeah. situation where, oh, how many pins can you slide through? So now they're going to just see, drop to their bed, oh my God, try and knock gross. down as many pins as they can. And, then now, and then right after that, they're working on standing back up onto their feet. So you're teaching skills, like you said, but now they're focused on, they're not focused on, oh, I'm going to fall down on the ice and it might not feel great or whatever. It's like, oh, I got to knock as many pins over as I can or, or whatever it is. I think, and then the other thing I have, and it triggered when uh, you were talking about, you know, the parents losing their mind on the glass. We used to coach. We had a later session, but the U9 group, or it might have been U7 group, was on before us. And early in the season, I went and had a conversation. It was a grandfather probably helping get kids to multiple sports. And I was like, what do you think of this? Oh, it's dumb. Why, why aren't we playing full ice? This is, and I'm like, okay. Like, he doesn't know this is what I do from nine to five all the time. But we, we yeah. ended up, I ended up talking to him in probably February, March that year. I was like, oh, hey, we just ended up standing next to each other while I was waiting for our guys to get ready. I was like, how's it going? He's like, I love it. Just observing, right? Like, just observing. I can see the benefits. Kids have fun. They're more engaged. They've developed more. So, I mean, don't knock it till you try it or see it, I guess, is the big thing for me. Is It is change. I know change is the hardest thing we as a society can go through, but I think there's so much benefit to the way U9 and below programming is, is taking place now that it's going to only benefit the athlete and our game and their experience. Right. And, and we want hockey players for life. Yeah. It doesn't end at U18, U20. I mean, 
we talk about it all the time. You're at U9, you're, everyone's going to end up, whether you make it at the NHL or not, we're all going to end up in the same place. It's going to be the community rink playing with your buddies at whatever age, if you love the game that much. <laughs> so. Yeah. You start and end at the same place. That's right. Exactly. What you do in between yeah. is up to you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what, guys. I, I got two things to, to, to maybe close on. And one I, I think is really relevant. Have you guys seen the seven, the CBC doc on the 72 yeah. series? Yeah. It's it's amazing. Mm-hmm. And um, one one comment that came out of that was Bobby Clark talking about growing up in Flin Flon, Manitoba. And he just said, like, I learned to play the game because every day after school, I went out. It was so damn cold. Like, we went and played on the lake. And he's like, that's what we learned. And he's like, small, small areas, just the kids. And he's like, I was playing with older kids. I had a fight for the puck. Yeah. And he goes, that's how I developed my – that's how I was taught, was just those, those small, competitive-type environments. So I thought that that was really telling. But, um, you know, to, to steer away <laughs> from Finland as, as we close. So we do this um, – we do this series of the coaches say called Hockey Factories. It's awesome. So we do a deep dive into, you know, the top development organizations in the world. And um, we're getting ready for season two. So we're talking with these organizations. So one of the organizations we're going to be profiling is Zug. So Zug is a little community about, um, it's less than 40,000 people. They have a team in the top Swiss professional league. They've won the league championship the last two years. And the story in Zug is the gentleman that owns the team was was in pharma and he developed a drug that and i and i this is where i get lost in the conversation um but anyways i just know that he developed a drug that at one point was like the top five pharmaceutical products in the world so just to paint a picture like money is not even a question so he says i got my career started in zug i'm going to buy a hockey team and i'm going to make sure that this is the best goddamn experience for kids and players and fans as it possibly can be and and again money's not an option so he builds this brand new facility it's a couple years old it's an unbelievable rank but then they build like another training center with the offices and everything in a practice ring and it's and they're walking us through this powerpoint and showing us videos and they're even picking up their laptops and we're like oh my god like this is like the new york yankees <laughs> don't have this and and then they show us the powerpoint on how they've gotten all these scientists and development and how to develop players the best way. And they've all this data and we're like, and then they get to the slide of what they came up with and guess what they came up with. The best way to develop players is small area games, lots of reps, lots of touches chain. Like they got to the, they, they, they didn't consult with hockey can. They just, they did this all on their own yeah. and they came right back to the same place. And a lot of it was looking at other sports and saying, what are they doing? And, yeah, it just you know, just like we're all going to end up at uh, in beer league, the same place we started. It's the same place you start. It's like look at other sports, and it's um, yeah, for you sure. Know, it, it's no, it's no different. It's it's just you know, these are all I think really rational points. So, anyways, I I think one thing we're going to try and do is um, wherever you're, if you're if you're listening to this episode, um, if you're watching it on YouTube or listening it on your favorite podcast, if you go to the OMHA site, if we do one thing, let's try and add some links. Um, with Mitch into the post so people can go back and look at some of the data that we refer to some great videos and resources out there but um, I really I really hope that this is you know if if anything I I I hope this episode isn't viewed as maybe um, confrontational I just hope it sparks a a discussion and and and, you know gives uh, whether it be coach coaches parents I just stop being to pause and say okay let's just step back for a second and look at what you know what we're trying to let can we get aligned on just what how players develop uh, as athletes and, and as hockey players but uh great conversation again guy mike you might be <laughs> locked in here like i don't you might have to block off thursday let so. me know I'll open the yeah, i think you should i think you should yeah. hey aaron aaron what i would say is i know you, i know you say you don't want to be confrontational i i kind of i kind of do actually I want it to be confrontational <laughs> <I love it. laughs> but but i don't want it to be preachy so, so there's a difference, yeah. right? Do you, do you know what I'm yeah. saying? Because, because oh, to yeah. me, to me, like, like w- w- the reason we have this is because we want it to benefit the most amount of players for the long term, right? So, so you know, when when um, you know when you give the example of Bobby Clark and he, yeah, and he says, "What else are you going to do in Flin Flon, Manitoba?" Like that was that was one of the best quotes of of that yeah. that session. But in the same in the same series, they're showing. Anatoly Tarasov, 
the, like all that, like you talk about skipping ropes and jumping and, oh, and, man, and then, yeah. how and cool then, is that footage? Oh, it, it, like it's ahead of its time. Right. And then, yeah. and then, and then using off ice to, to do a bunch of other stuff. Cause they only had natural ice. They didn't have artificial ice. So, so they spent the rest of the year, you know, carrying around rocks and, <laughs> and piggybacking each other up hills and stuff. Right. Like, so it's crazy, but, but that speaks to, you know, you use what you have available to, to you, right? Bobby Clark had a frozen pond, <laughs> you know, Tarasov was, was making stuff up. So like, that's where the challenge is for me. Like, like there's like, I, I think we we're bringing all the best data forward. We're bringing the, the way to have more kids playing longer in the best environment possible. And, and then be creative, <laughs> be creative because I think there's lots of cool things um, that, that, that coaches can do and use. And, and last but not least, and we've talked a lot about this is we don't, you know, um, you know, we don't have to be in such a rush. Let's put these things in place. Let's build a foundation and kids will find their, their watermark the same way they do in Finland, the same way they do in the U S the same yeah, way they do percent. in Whitby, Ontario. You know what I mean? So, um, I, I just, I want to add, and I don't even know the, the right place for this to happen, but for anybody that's listening and if you're a coach or your parent, if, if you, if, if you do something that's really creative that you think is valuable, that, that, that can help other coaches, if you're a parent and you have a coach that you think is doing something really cool, if you, if you went to your local rink and you saw somebody yeah. doing something that you thought was worth sharing, reach out. We'd love to hear those ideas. If it's, especially if anybody has it like on video or coaches happen to record it. I, I just think that there's so much value because to your point, Ian, like at the end of the day, all, all the the structural stuff doesn't matter. It really comes down to the coach is are they uh, are they motivated and passionate about finding ways to connect with their kids to make them better? And right. I don't. And I think that like cross ice full does none of that matters. That's that's where the magic's going to happen. So if there's any ideas out there, uh, let's share them. Let's make sure everybody's getting access to that to that information. And guys, this has been awesome. Again, thank you so much, and uh, hope everybody out there enjoyed listening to this uh, episode of Breakaway.